Good morning and welcome to the 2021 MA Wing Summit. We're viewing uh, logos from our supporting organizations. This morning's virtual leadership briefing from G3ICT is brought to you with our team from G3ICT, IAAP, and EJ Kraus. While we're together virtually today, our M Enabling Summit in the past has been in person. Join us today on Twitter with the hashtag or fought by following at M Enabling Summit. Some Sorry. photos, yes. Sorry, Sam, we're not seeing the presentation. Oh, it's not showing. Well, that's not good. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Today's virtual leadership briefing is brought to us by AT&T and T-Mobile. We're looking at some pictures from previous M Enabling Summits. We'll look forward to being with you in person again soon. Yeah. I'm going to switch for a moment just to make sure that my screen is sharing my presentation and not. There we go. Hey, and this is Rachel. We are seeing the slides now. We're in presentation mode? Yes. We're listening to some music from Homer Gaines. He's a UX designer and accessibility expert. While we're watching slides from M Enabling Sessions past, we'll look forward to being together in person again soon. Today's virtual leadership briefing is brought to us by AT&T and T-Mobile. Again, we're seeing panels from Enabling Past, the discussion groups, the large sessions, and people enjoying time with our exhibitors, colleagues, and friends from around the world. This fall, join us in Washington, D.C., October 4th through the 6th for Promoting Accessible Technologies and Environments. Save the date. Follow the hashtags mEnabling21 and mEnablingBriefing21 on Twitter. Again, today's virtual leadership briefing is brought to us by AT&T and T-Mobile. The screen is sharing a group of sponsoring and supporting organizations from around the world. The organizers of the virtual leadership briefing are G3ICT and EJ Krauss and Associates. The G3ICT, IAAP, and EJ Krauss team are featured on this slide. Thank you to our accessibility teams of interpreters and captionists today. You can follow M Enabling on Twitter at M Enabling Summit. Great to see smiling faces from our colleagues from around the world on some of these photos, uh, some of our speakers and presentations. 
Again, we thank you for joining us today. Our virtual leadership briefing is brought to you by AT&T. I believe that's Susan Missouri on the screen just a moment ago. <laughs> She'll be joining us later today for our leadership briefing. Thank you again to AT&T and T-Mobile for our virtual leadership briefing support today. Our photos from G3ICT M Enabling Summit's past are featured with our colleagues and friends. I see some virtual reality demonstrations, presentations. Again, thank you to AT&T and T-Mobile for their support of today's leadership briefing. We'll be leading into today's program in just a moment as we look at a few images of M Enabling Summit's past with our friends and colleagues, learning and engaging with one another. Save the date for this fall, October 4th to 6th in Washington, DC for promoting accessible technologies and environments. Follow the hashtags M Enabling 21 and M Enabling Briefing 21 on Twitter. Our next session will begin in just a few moments. I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Christopher Lee. Thank you, Sam. My name is Christopher Lee, and uh, it is a great to have everyone on today um, for our briefing. As was mentioned by Sam, um, this is the um, powered by AT&T and T-Mobile. Um, it is our virtual leadership briefing. We have a great um, group of panelists today and speakers. Um, it's going to be a really great event and um, we do have it broken up into two areas so there will be a break um, about 12 Eastern time US 1205 and um, other than that we'll go straight through. My name is Christopher Lee. I am the managing director of um, IWAP and the chief learning officer for G3ICT and I welcome everyone today. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Excel the Law. And Excel is the president and executive director of G3ICT. He's a true advocate of individuals with disabilities and has been working on this pretty much all his life. But in 2006, he started G3ICT to support the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So Excel, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, that's to describe myself, and so I am the baby boomer in the organization, and uh, also uh, very much uh, uh, passionate about the topic of uh, today's meeting, uh, which is the uh, acceleration of innovation for uh, inclusive virtual workplaces for persons with disabilities. And this morning, uh, I would like to uh, uh, qu quickly review a couple of facts which we gathered through a survey to which uh, many of you responded. Uh, which we uh, sent when we had about 500 uh, respondents. And the first question we had was uh, whether or not you saw the shift to virtual workplaces as favorable or unfavorable to the increment of persons with disabilities. And the, the massive response that is extremely encouraging is that 70% of, of you uh, see the shift to virtual workplaces as actually favorable to persons with disabilities employment. And 5.5% I think it's unfavorable and about quarter, I'm not sure. So overall, I think it's more like a positive mood than a negative mood. Uh, the second fact that I wanted to emphasize before we, we get started is when we, we ask you about what's going on in your organization, 82%, which is really a massive, a massive majority, uh, report increased awareness and demand for accessibility for workplaces. And 2% said they have decreased. So I mean, you know, I think there is a real, uh, real consensus here that uh, we are in, 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 a, in a, at a time when COVID-19 really helped accelerate the awareness and, and, and requirements for access, digital accessibility. 
the, the, the third fact I would like to, to, to emphasize before we get started. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when we ask uh, participants today, what were the causes of accessibility barriers of virtual work environments? Uh, a very important point is that 65% or almost two thirds of participants uh, see that uh, the lack of awareness and proper use of existing accessibility features of mainstream application is the main cause for, for barriers. And 35% said that it's more likely the results from a lack of accessibility features with the product themselves. So in the, in the comments that you gave us in the survey, we see that uh, a lot of the uh, comments had to do with just-in-time need for just-in-time training and features in product to help the user edit accessible content. And the fourth and last point, which is really uh, important for today's meeting, is that about close to two-thirds of you see the acceleration of accessibility innovation uh, for virtual work environment having accelerated during COVID-19. So clearly between those four points, it's clear that we are at an inflection point in, in, in time in terms of the evolution of digital accessibility, uh, certainly pushed by the need for accessibility for virtual work environment, which is great news. So today's agenda is very structured to help us answer some of those uh, questions and investigate further what we may expect in the near future. Uh, we'll review technology directions that matter for accessible virtual work environments. We then look at a snapshot of the future of workplaces and of people's uh, fast evolving expectation. Uh, then third point, we will uh, see what we can learn from the pandemic itself uh, with hands-on observation made by employees with disabilities and workplace accommodation experts during the pandemic, see what happened in, re in, on, in, the, in reality. And fourth, how digital accessibility innovation is likely to drive new employment opportunities for persons with disabilities, since this is like an overwhelming positive perception for you, by you all. And then last but not the least, for fifth point, we, we will try to get perspective of what opportunities uh, in the future of work hold. Uh, with that, I would like uh, to introduce to you our first uh, speaker today. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you uh, Jennifer Sheehy, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, as you all know, Jennifer Sheehy is the uh, long-term advocate for the uh, empowerment of persons with disabilities and uh, the mission for uh, ODEP that she currently uh, uh, leads is to develop policy that increases job opportunities for youth and adults with disabilities. Now, of course, uh, her long career has been totally dedicated to opportunities or enhancing opportunities for persons with disabilities uh, at the Department of Education, at the White House, and at the National Organization on Disabilities. So uh, uh, Jennifer is really uh, probably the most inspiring and, and, and a qualified speaker to kick, us on, uh, kick off our meeting today. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Axel. And one, one thing I love about these uh, virtual conferences is the outreach we're able to do and inclusion of people that can't necessarily travel. I also love seeing the numbers tick up in the participant box. And at this point, we are already at 352 uh, of the people that are needed to make some of the changes that we're talking about today. So very, very exciting. Thank you so much for also including ODEP because uh, we have a big job to do. We cannot do it alone. Inclusive COVID recovery is our number one employment priority, and we need your help. Uh, so what's our landscape in terms of numbers? You know, I'm, I'm with the Department of Labor. We love our numbers. In the world, approximately 15% of the world's population or 1 billion people experience some form of disability. And as COVID continues to have wide reaching impacts across the globe, it's important to consider how people with disabilities are really disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, in particular in terms of employment. So 
about 23% of uh, Americans 18 and older report having a disability. In February 2020, a year ago before the COVID-19 recession, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities was 7.8% and the labor force participation rate was 20.7%. So the unemployment rate is people looking for work who cannot find work. The labor force participation rate is people who are working or looking for work. That is such a low number. And unfortunately, the recession has uh, severely impacted employment outcomes for people with disabilities. In March 2021, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities was 10.2% compared to 6% for people without disabilities. And the workforce participation rate for people with disabilities was 20.2% compared to 66.8% for individuals without disabilities. So we really have our work cut out for us, but I truly, truly believe what we're talking about today, accessible technology, creating more flexibility in the work environment, uh, more agility in the work environment is going to bring that labor force participation rate up in a way that we have not experienced before. And emerging evidence shows that COVID-19, as you mentioned, is accelerating the migration toward an economy grounded in technology and virtual commerce. This shift may have a significant impact on people with disabilities. While this transition has been long predicted, uh, the rapid speed of change starting a year ago was certainly unanticipated. In a report of the future of the workforce by the Council of State Governments, uh, the report noted that opportunities, new technologies like automation and artificial intelligence will create uh, benefits for people with disabilities. And as governments at all level and businesses move to more permanent tele teleworking uh, flexibilities and allowance, the pandemic may open doors to more employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Anecdotally, a year ago, we heard from many of our, our company partners, uh, business organizations we work with, that people with disabilities were actually advising their business leadership in how to transition to a virtual world because some of them had been teleworking as a reasonable accommodation and teleworking became something that all companies that could do uh, implemented and in many cases, people with disabilities are were leading that charge, which I think was very, very telling. The restructuring of many jobs during the pandemic may ultimately benefit people with disabilities by making employers more willing to accommodate the need for home-based work. Recent research shows that nearly 50% of the workforce that can is still teleworking uh, and 25% of workers want to make their remote work permanent. I mean, even in the Department of Labor, we're an employer too. We did a telework survey and found that 80% of employees wanted to uh, work three or more days a week. So there is going to be a shift and we need to be prepared for it. So, and some of the work that ODEP has been doing in working with developers and technologists and employers and uh, the smart people that are on this, in this conference and uh, participating as attendees they, we've worked on accessible autonomous vehicle technology. We've worked on um, artificial intelligence, fairness and inclusion. We've worked on extended reality and, um, and virtual reality technology to make sure that people with disabilities are, that their opportunities are enhanced by these technologies and not disadvantaged when that technology moves too quickly and they are left behind. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Axel and really excited about this fantastic conference today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Deputy Assistant Secretary Jennifer. Thank you for taking the time and spending with us on this important issue. 
So I'd like to bring to the floor Shelby, and I will just share my screen here. Shelby Kapoor and um, Jennifer Ploy, um, welcome today. We are so happy to have you both. Um, today's topic is going to be an interview for 15 minutes. Jennifer, we got you for 15 minutes. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, it is um, going to be on the, the topic of technology direction um, that matters for accessibility virtual work environments. Um, Shelby, I've known you for so long as a colleague and a friend, and I tell you what, you have really done some amazing things just to read off a couple things. I mean, obviously, everyone knows probably that you are the CEO of um, and founder of Barrier Break. Um, in 2019, Shelby was recognized as one of the top 15 women transforming India, not so shabby, Shelby, and in 2017 was recognized as one of the most powerful women in business by Business Today magazine. So Shelby, welcome. Uh, I look forward to your interview with Jennifer and Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Chris. Um, hi, Jenny. I am waiting to see how I can see her. Ah, oh, there she is. Oh, I'm definitely here, Shelby. Good morning, good afternoon. Hi there, folks. How are you doing today? I'm good. The sun is shining in Seattle, so we, we take that when we can. I know that I see a few other Seattleites on here. It's a good day. That's brilliant. Um, so today's conversation, uh, you know, I don't think Jenny needs an introduction. Jenny is the Chief Accessibility Officer of Microsoft. Um, and I'll just give a slight anecdotal story to that. I remember starting working with Microsoft in 2007 in India. And I remember that, you know, I had to uh, try and explain to the Microsoft India team what accessibility was. And then once you came on board, um, you know, the tide just changed and everybody started to understand accessibility. So Jenny is one of those that I think is, is truly an evangelist in our space and getting Microsoft to move, hats off to you, I must say. Um, so let's start from there. So Jenny, you know, we just heard Jennifer earlier on speak about uh, how, you know, businesses are reacting to work from home and how they, you know, there is an opportunity, but also a challenge for people with disabilities. So how do you see it? You know, you see a very different picture from what all of us see. And how do you see technology enhancing that opportunity or the challenge that is there? So I, I appreciate, I, I was uh, scribbling away notes, um, you know, listening to, to Jennifer Sheehy and, um, and Axel from the research that you've done. I think it validates what a lot of us have uh, lived through in the last year um, in our roles in accessibility as persons with disabilities. Um, I think we've seen a, a bit of a curve, uh, the initial shock of, of what was happening and having to flip and turn uh, our worlds into virtual. For me as, as a deaf individual, that meant figuring out how to do my daily workload online um, and figure out how to work with a 2D version of an ASL interpreter. Um, and you know, just fully recognizing after a week that what worked in a physical environment doesn't work in a virtual environment. And you really have to change that. Everyone went through their own process with that. And in, in many ways, they're still going through that process. And there was the initial kick of, this is a really positive move. This is fantastic. We've been asking to work from home for decades as a community. Um, and then also the other side of things in, in terms of um, the swell that we then saw on accessibility, our Disability Answer Desk, which is our support team here. We've had it, gosh, about eight years now running. Um, and it takes around 12 to 13,000 calls a month. Shut up. In fact, um, we were running and have been running at around 300% of volume from enterprise customers um, and a pretty heavy tick from consumers for a year now. And most of it is, it isn't bug fix. It's people new to accessibility, trying to figure out features that will work from them, trying to get educated on how to get captioning in the right place, how to make sure that they've got the right magnification of features um, coming new into our world. And so I think, you know, as I, as I look at employment going out, I think we've got a heavy burden of responsibility. Um, we've learned a lot from the virtual world. We've now got a transition uh, to a hybrid um, and a new world. Um, and so I think that there's a heavy burden on us right now. 
I think you you hit it bang on, Jenny. I think that's what all of us felt. Uh, there was the high, there was the low, and I think we're all learning to cope with it as we go along. Um, and then, you know, in the virtual world, communication become one of is one of the most important things, right? Um, and I think the first question that a lot of the survey brought out was people yet having questions about the virtual conferencing systems, right? It is yet not so easy for people to know how to maneuver in this world, uh, keeping accessibility in mind. And though we have, you know, all of the solution providers who've come forward and are working towards it, we also know that there is a lot more that has to be done to make virtual conferencing uh, accessible. So would love to hear your thoughts, you know, and what you're doing at Microsoft and how do you see it? Yeah, clearly one of the first things that really happened was, you know, how do I make sure that my meetings, my environments, my, my communication with my team um, was still able to happen in the virtual world. And I do think technically from an accessibility lens, again, a lot of learning. Uh, the first one that we had was captioning. Um, now we've got AI, we use a Microsoft Teams as our predominant uh, communications environment uh, for Microsofties. Um, and we had AI captioning embedded. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the work had been done before the pandemic hit. Uh, so we had captioning there, transcript, hand raise, um, simple features. In fact, that was actually a feature created by a neurodiverse engineer um, so that you, you can interrupt and not have to worry about when socially it's the right place to do so. But we saw a pretty significant uptick in that captioning. In fact, the volume on captioning from April versus February was 30x, 30x. And we don't see those kind of, clearly that was unprecedented. Um, but we didn't have it across all of our environments. So that was one of the first gigs was to make sure that it wasn't just something that you were, there was an equity and equality in access to these features um, and there wasn't a cost barrier to them. So just making sure that those features were not just there for some folks that happened to get an early rev or, or had this type of license, but it was open into all of our products. So it's, it is from free version to free, the very complex versions. I think the other is really the, the, the other thing that we've learned a lot is that we've done a ton on how to use different products as well as making them easier to use. It's got to be easier to find and use accessible features. It's got to be. Um, and so there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one and training and materials we can do, but also working on the core engineering of those. Uh, and then just listening to your channels. Uh, if you're not listening to your community and your user base, whether those are employees, customers, advocates, community, you're missing out on a wealth of insight. Um, and so actually Disability Answered Essay I mentioned, while it's a great service um, for people just to get the help they need, for me it's gold dust because I get that filtered view of what's causing headaches, what's causing issues that we can then iterate on. Are there features in there that people want to see? So you know, just listening, I think. We, we could all do a better job at listening. Let's be real. Wow. So listening to the users, and I think users have come front and center in the virtual world because we're all using this. It's not that it's just one or two of us, but we've all, you know, just come on the bandwagon. Um, but, you know, how do you keep pace with all of this technology? I literally find that every morning I can wake up today and see a new feature from Microsoft that I'm dying to go out and try, right? How, how do you make it happen and how do you keep the team going? Because I think we need to learn that as we build other office tools and other collaborative tools, whether it's CRMs, ERPs, any kind of a tool that's being created. So how do we take that learning of yours and put it into every other kind of application that we are building? Yes, isn't that a fascinating uh, trend in our industry? And I don't think that's just uh, one company. I think that's the nature of technology. I, I've had the privilege of being here at Microsoft 16 years. And, and honestly, you know, you mentioned things have changed. That's because not of one human and definitely not because of, of me. It's because of an army of dedicated, passionate individuals who have really taken the charge with accessibility um, across every product, service, website, app and more. We're far from perfect, but I would say it's endemic and part of our DNA. 
Um, and that means that every day people are iterating on features, they're adding, they're listening to those um, bug requests or features, um, and they're embedding it into product. I think ultimately our job is really, we know that we've got a core avid, core base of, of people who love to test the new stuff. Um, and you know, we dog food our own products. That's a, a term we, we, in fact, I'm sitting here with the latest version of Teams that isn't out yet. We all sit here and dog food our products. That's something that actually every Microsoft employee does do. And we also test those products with people with disabilities through the Shepherd Center and through a, a pretty rigorous testing environment. But ultimately we get them out because it's concentric rings. I'm kind of with my hands dropping circles um, that go all forever out. And as we get them out, then we get more feedback coming in from, from the early adopters right the way through to people. Ultimately, I would say, yes, technology has accelerated. And this year has put more into digital transformation and an emphasis on accessibility and forced us all to accelerate. There is a lot coming out at the moment. Ultimately though, what you'll see is your product because we're all cloud connected with our products, they update. And when they update, it should just be right there. Um, and so I would say, don't, don't panic. I'm um, trying to keep up with everything. You will ultimately just see it core and instrumental in the software that there is. Um, and if you want to be a complete nerd, uh, which is the best compliment I can give to any technical early adopter, come join the nerd gang. Then we, yes, we can get you on those early rings. Brilliant. Um, so collaborative tools, right, from other companies. Uh, that I'm sure Microsoft is also using, and so are a large number of us, right? Um, how do we bring that into the fold of accessibility? Um, I know that at Microsoft, um, you know, a lot of the products that you are using from vendors, you're asking them to make accessible also, right? Uh, and I think lots of companies are doing this from a procurement perspective and getting suppliers onboarded and right. getting accessibility as a forefront of it. Yeah. So, um, because you know, the buying power of all of us as organizations is a lot bigger than anything else. So how do we use that leverage and accelerate the accessibility need and not only just the assistive technology aspect of it, of getting uh, communication and, and you know, just systems that we're using in organizations to be accessible? Right, so we definitely see it like many others on the call. Accessibility is a responsibility. It needs to be managed like a business. It needs to be managed and measured. Um, you know, what we do internally is absolutely that. We, we built also a maturity model so that we can understand how we're doing. Thank you to Level Access who we, we snarfed in their model. We added to it, we iterated and we published that last year. We've got all of those business vehicles but if you're really going to have an ecosystem where accessibility is just part of it, that includes your supply chain. Um, we got 20,000 suppliers. Uh, they range from the huge to the small. Um, it's been actually in our contract since 2015. Um, and accessibility is not one you can redline or remove because um, you shouldn't be able to do that. Um, but I think the kicker that we've had is really I, you know, many people will sign for accessibility, but the awareness and understanding of what the word means and actually delivering accessible work product um, is really the magic. And then how do you empower a supplier who may be new to accessibility, may not have seen this, or had a company ask to test the product before they receive it uh, for final payment? Um, that's what we're doing right now. Um, and I will say that it's led to some utterly fantastic conversations. Um, and what we've done as a result of those conversations is put out uh, supplier training. Uh, we actually partner with a lot of our suppliers to help them through the journey of accessibility. What is it? Yes, it's, it, it's not negotiable. Yes, we are going to look at your product. Uh, we're not going to take your word for it. And here's how to get on that. It is a core requirement of working with Microsoft. That's it. Um, because ultimately, if I'm going to, as a, as a CAO, if I'm going to make sure that our employees, our customers have a great experience, 
that includes what we work with as partners. Um, I think the other side, it, you know, is, is Microsoft has an ecosystem as well. So it's not just what we consume, it's also the platform that we allow others to develop on. And that's always been the, one of the coolest parts about say Windows is that you can build on top of it. Um, and this is where you still, MVDA, JAWS, Zoom text, I can keep nuance um, with Dragon, which we're very excited to bring into the family. Um, you know, I think there's there's also the opportunity that there is to do some really cool, exciting things that add to that platform. So I think it goes both ways as well. Um, and uh, it's a big, big responsibility, but we have to bluntly be more hardcore about it. Um, sign the paperwork, but then deliver. And that's where we're at right now. That's fabulous. I need to say thank you for your time with us uh, because I think we're running out of time, but I have one last question and I literally need you to do it in a short way. What, what's the most exciting thing we should look for in the next couple of months coming out on some of the Microsoft products? Any insight? I see, Shilpi, you're looking for insider secrets. I, I am, um, no, I, no, no, I, I, but join the Ability Summit. Uh, May 5, 6, we're super excited. Um, we have a two day gig going on, lots of speakers. Some of you are part of that gang and we're so grateful for your time. Lots to come. Ooh, thank you. Thank you, Jenny, as always. And Christopher, back to you. Oh, Jennifer, thank you so much. Shelby, that was wonderful. So many great points. And um, we appreciate your time, both of y'all today. Okay, so moving on um, to our next um, um, spotlight today during um, our briefing, um, we have um, Lauren Romanski. Um, she is the Managing Vice President of Gardner. Welcome, Lauren. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Chris. Just, uh, just a fun fact before I, get, before I turn it over to you. Um, Lauren, in 2016, she launched the Gardner CEB's Diversity and Inclusion Leadership Council and just looking at your your bio, you're definitely passionate about DNI. I am, um, yeah. So, which is part of why I'm so happy to be here today. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Great. Good. Well, I am. I am so happy to be here today. I am. I am passionate about DNI. I am also passionate about including uh, people with disabilities as well. I work across talent segments, um, but this one is is near and dear to my heart. Um, I, for for those of you who can't see me, I am. I have brown hair. I'm in a blue sweater. I'm sitting here in some beautiful natural light here outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, but I'm going to be giving a lightning talk, which is uh, going to certainly build on Axel, Jennifer, Shilby, and Carrie's comments. I'm glad to follow them. And I hope to bring some extra voice, including an understanding of how business leaders are imagining hybrid work broadly, even those not as far along as Carrie at Microsoft, um, and adding to Axel's data as well. So it, when I sat down to, to think about this, conference and this opportunity. I was remembering um, Gartner's Reimagine HR conference two years ago. I was presenting about how technology will drive equality for people with disabilities and um, Jennifer's comments resonated. You know, I was pushing on the labor market opportunity um, and, and making the case, you know, and at the time it seemed a little bit ambitious and theoretical, um, but all of a sudden we have seen acceleration of a lot of those timelines. Notably not all of them, but, but many of them. Um, and not to mention a much needed explosion of discussions around equity, equality, and how we redesign work to maximize opportunity, which should matter for all of us too. Um, Gartner, as a research and advisory firm, we have a long history of advising enterprises, governments, tech suppliers on how IT work design can improve top line, bottom line, and all of the employees' lives in between. Um, as I, I work in our HR practice. So that means my clients are really dialed in now to that question of work and how it gets done. And so I wanna share some research um, based on our client engagements, um, but as well as some dedicated quantitative study. And my colleagues began this about four months after the pandemic hit. 
Um, and the study itself took over six months to put together. So we're really excited to share it with our clients. The key findings are immense and intense, but we're gonna start with an easy one. So I, I'll ask you all to think back to a moment where you were before the pandemic broke out, wherever you are in the world. Here in the US, that was March of 2020. Perhaps you went to an office, um, perhaps you had predetermined work hours of nine to five. And one of the things we know is that, you know, these premises of work are woefully outdated. Offices were created before accessible broadband and now common technology, telecoms. Um, and even that terminology, a remote employee signaled that the office is the center of what we do, right? The employees are somewhere else. And nine to five just happens to be the hours we inherited from the pre-industrial revolution because we needed that natural light I mentioned uh, to do our jobs. But does it really have to be that way? And so turning to the next page here, there's a simple question here. If work had never been invented and today was day one, how would you design how we work? And this is the question we're asking our clients and we're pushing executives to think through. You know, there were so many challenges of 2020 and continuing today into 2021. And, um, you know, there, there still is this inspiring opportunity for business leaders in front of us. But we need to stop, and this is again echoing comments of, of those who've been here before me, to stop trying to create the world we had. It wasn't perfect anyway. We want to encourage you to consider a blank slate and consider your organizations to consider a blank slate at least for a moment. We know that old work design left many employees out, unable to fully contribute, uh, and that equity imperative I mentioned, it's more important today to business leaders than ever before. And recreating Everything that we used to do virtually, well, that does accelerate some of that technology. It does help accessibility in some ways, but the result is first, it doesn't go far enough. And second, it's exhausting everyone. Um, there's a huge opportunity here for us to shift some of those design principles. And so let's start about the, where we are today. We're somewhere between that initial pandemic catalyst that I mentioned of you know, more than a year ago and we're certainly still far away from that future state that we're dreaming of here. So I have a page here that just says moves, uh, many found the move to remote work challenging. You know, and again, I'm speaking with business leaders across the globe here. Um, and you know, we didn't get it just right when everybody moved to that pandemic. No one had a second to consider that big question that I have the luxury of posing on the previous page. There was a humanitarian crisis, a health crisis, the quickly ensuing economic crisis, and the knee-jerk reaction of business leaders across the world was to just keep that ship afloat. It's not surprising then that when the pandemic forced us into that remote and hybrid world, we felt these losses compared to the office environment. And this page shows three graphics overviewing those losses. Um, you'll see first the loss of consistency. We heard time and time again, everyone's in their own environment. As you see our stick person on her couch with her cat. Um, this brings up challenging questions. What is our culture? How do we create something consistent to hang on to and define us, who we are as a company? On the right, this loss of visibility. I don't know what my employees are doing anymore. It's shown here with a depiction of an Outlook calendar blocked, but you can't see any of the details. We hear that from our clients. Everyone's work patterns are obscured. What are they doing? And certainly managers and senior leaders are really worried that we weren't working. And we heard that a lot too. And then lastly, at the bottom, I think this is probably the most bemoaned loss we heard from our clients. We are losing that serendipity, you know, that magic, that innovation, everything is scheduled now. And so these three perceived losses and characteristics had a lot to do with how we used to do work. Uh, and those teams and leaders wondering how to handle these dynamics without that physical space. And so here's a page, a headline is just solve the problems with an office-centric office design. Um, and the pandemic happened quickly. And for some orgs, it, would, it was a matter of days or weeks. And for others, they may have been planning for a couple of weeks or months, but it, it's understandable that they keep working the way we were before was the common goal in that aftermath. So, the losses we just discussed, you know, what were we going to do about them? Well, first there's consistency. Um, clients wanted to provide a consistent work experience and will rely on this work principle of equality of experiences. So then we virtualize. And this is again, good for some, but it doesn't go far enough. We have these new tools, 
software expectations of how we work together in an online way that emulate the office. That second challenge around tracking, visibility, you know, knowing who's doing what and when, well, it's led us to this work design principle of managing performance by inputs. You know, and, and we have so many leaders who are developing new ways to track employees and understand those inputs and where they are. And then lastly, solving that loss of serendipity. Well, our client's work design principle here was to enable serendipitous connection. And what did we get? More meetings. Uh, and this provides some innovation by chance, you know, and ensures that employees are connecting. And so I think everybody said, okay, we're managing, that should help. We can recoup those losses, you know, in our, in our new remote world. Um, and you'll see here though, the result is on this page is the icon of an office. You know, we're remote, but to what ends? We're still in a box. We're still holding on to the idea on the page here that location is the stable pillar we design work around. We've just managed to create that digitally. And most of us may recall how overwhelming that transition was. And as I look at these approaches and honestly evaluate them, maybe it's not so bad. It certainly could have been a worse transition for employees and organizations overall. But now, you know, we see in a recent survey that almost half of organizations are expecting to have 60% or more of their workforce remote after the pandemic. 87% of organizations say they'll have more than 20% of employees working remotely. And with that kind of longer term horizon, this current remote environment we're in right now is not going to be what's gonna work for the future. So that's what I have here, this, this idea it's not working, a headline on this page, how current strategies are adding to the problem. You see a stick person, uh, looks kind of like me sitting at my desk here, you know, with just this kind of frustration emanating from her head. Um, and I'll put some data behind this too. 96% 96% of HR leaders told us fatigue is a problem in how we're working today. I'd imagine we all know that. We see it in the headlines, we see it in our teams and in our own houses. But our clients are less aware of how those strategies I just overviewed are making things worse. Let's assume there's a baseline fatigue for this stick person here on the page um, and they're experiencing from working at home. There's fatigue from uh, just components of digital work, digital distractions, of virtual overload, there's always on expectations. We were able to quantify that and it turns out that adding virtualization, this idea that just everything we did in the office, we can now do somewhere else online, um, it makes it 30% more likely that our employees feel they're working too hard. And if we track our employees' work, that theory of inputs, let's and, and track and make sure that's, that's happening, it makes employees more than 90% more likely to pretend they're working. And lastly, let's add more meetings. Our solution for that loss of serendipity makes it 24% more likely that employees are emotionally drained from their work. And so if we're gonna do this for the long haul, we can't recreate what we had in the office in our new hybrid world. Now on this page here, it's not without note, is that employees with disabilities are doing okay in this new world and on the whole better than in the office. And I love Axel's stuff that opened this about the number of attendees here who find it favorable. That's true of employees writ large, but it's, it's true of employees with disabilities as well. And two data points here. Um, this page has two graphs showing how employees with disabilities appreciate and thrive in a remote or hybrid environment. Each graph compares an on-site environment with employees in a hybrid or remote environment. Uh, the orange bars represent employees with disabilities and the blue bars are for overall employee average. So on the left, we asked a question, my team ensures all team members feel equally heard and respected. On site, you can see 64% of respondents uh, without disabilities agreed that was true, but only 56% of employees with disabilities agreed. But in a remote or hybrid environment, however, those numbers jump. For employees without disabilities, uh, it's 71%, and it's 81% overall of employees with disabilities. Now, to be clear, even this 81% isn't great news in the hybrid world. It certainly could be better, but the jump from just about half to more than three quarters of employees saying that their team is functionally inclusive in a remote world is a significant improvement. 
On the right, we asked a different question. My manager aims to provide equal access to their time on all of their direct reports. And even on site, employees with disabilities outpace the overall employee average here, um, but still only 60% responded yes. So what do we do instead? Uh, as suggested by the top here, let's redesign work for the hybrid world. Instead of those design principles we started with, we're asking clients to shift to a human-centric world. On this page, we have our office-centric design on the left, an arrow moving us to the right of the page towards the human-centric design. We can all take on hybrid and kind of harness that positive story we saw on the previous page and make it better so all of our employees aren't fatigued, aren't languishing. That's been Adam Grant's big article this week. It's really, really cool if you haven't read it. Uh, and have the endurance to go the distance. So a new work principle, let's focus on equality of opportunity, not experience. Let's focus on performance by outputs, not inputs. And let's innovate by design and not by chance. As we shift those principles in the context of our new realities, hybrid remote gives us these practical to-dos. And these are the conversations we're having with our clients daily right now. First, you must give employees the flexibility they need to step away from distractions, create their best environment, set their own schedule, their own workspace. Employees need that. And the way to do it is to approach it from the bottom up. We need to listen, another theme that's coming back. Second, driving empathy from our leaders. We need leaders today who tell us to get off our laptops in the world where we're struggling to connect and support us in making those connections where we need to. And lastly, hardwire that intentionality into how and where teams collaborate to limit those draining interactions and open networks that's gonna create equity. Rely less on meetings as the primary source of working together. And so what human-centric gets you, you see on this page, some outlines I'll read over here, uh, a 44 percentage reduction in fatigue. If you do those kind of second set of design principles I just mentioned, a 45 percentage point increase in intent to stay, and finally a 28 percentage point increase in employee performance. Okay, this page here, redesign for accessibility. Uh, this is an accessibility toolkit one of my colleagues recently authored. It shows a visual of the design cycle. On the left, you see a customer problem uh, leading all the way to the customer solution with steps like ideate, design, test, moving from left to right. But importantly, an orange arrow reading accessibility goes throughout. And so many times when I talk with clients about any underrepresented underrepresented or marginalized talent segment, I hear about averages. What's happening as leaders adjust and make plans with employee input generally? They're happy to have some data, they're happy to have some, some points, you know, here, here's what we're gonna do for our employees. But what's exciting right now for this important pool of employees with disabilities are first, what's good for the average worker right now, figuring out a way to sustainably create a hybrid remote work environment is good for everyone. We're aligned with the average. Our interests align, it lowers that need uh, for organizations to accommodate, to, to think farther, to go further. And so that, when I hear the favorability of where we are now, I think that's been some of the progress, you know, those, that alignment. But the second piece is that everything is being redesigned and that's what's on this page represents. Uh, when we talk to HR leaders, to talent leaders, uh, performance management, the way we talk about succession, the way we set up our intranet, all of our internal communications, everything is being redesigned for our new work environment. And this opens the door. It opens the door for inclusion, for accommodation, for innovation. And if you're familiar with any of the, the nudge work, uh, inclusion nudges, for instance, or how to change these prompts to ensure inclusion, process redesign is a really, really great place to start. The headline on page 10 here is our last page, the future is hybrid. We're working with our clients to ensure we're adapting to an employee-centric design. This page shows the square peg of the office-centric design on the left here, fitting into that office environment. It shows the same square peg not fitting into this triangle hole here labeled remote environment. And it brings us back to our initial question as it shows with a question mark above hybrid environment. What is the future? that we can imagine. How would we redesign work? 
So as we redesign that round peg for that round hole, we're suggesting organizations give employees the flexibility they need to step away from distractions and create their best environment. Set in intentional collaboration norms to limit draining interactions. And third, drive empathy from leaders. If we can take that momentum afforded as processes are redesigned and optimized for equity, we'll be well on our way. And so we're looking forward to working with our clients on that next normal. It's not gonna be smooth, it's not gonna be simple, uh, but there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of possibilities, especially for employees who have yet to be fully enabled and included in the workforce. Thank you. Well, and thank you so much. And thank you for your time. Interesting points. Um, we're so glad that God is in this, this space and feeding us data. So again, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So um, we've got a, a poll talking about data right now. And um, this is a survey poll that's up on the screen right now. And I'll read the questions. And we're going to pause and give it some, some time for people to answer the questions. Then we'll give the results. Um, so has um, the topic of the impact of virtual work processes in employees with disabilities, on employees with disabilities, been raised in your organization over the past year? So again, has the topic of the impact of virtual work processes on employees with disabilities been raised in your organization over the past year? The two responses, choices, is either yes or no. So we'll just pause for a few minutes. Information is coming in real time right now. Okay, so we're gonna share the results. And um, we've got right now showing 76% um, yes and 24% um, no. So um, quite interesting information. So thank you for taking the poll and we appreciate it. We'll have another poll coming up later on. Okay, so our next um, panel discussion, I'm pretty excited about it. We have a great group of folks that Maria is gonna introduce to us. Um, it's on hands-on observations made by employees with disabilities and workplace accommodations experts during the pandemic. I wanna bring on the screen, um, Maria Town. Maria is the um, president and CEO of the Association of People with Disabilities, AAPD. Um, she has served as a former senior associate director in the Obama White House. And she has been named recently to the Susan Daniels Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame. So welcome, Maria. Maria, we have you um, still, um, there you go, your mic is off. Let's see. We are pausing just a second right now. This is Christopher. Maria's getting her audio. still having trouble with your audio. I don't know, Rachel, um, from the technical assistance, if you can, I'm seeing um, her mic on. Okay, give us just one second as we get Maria back on. For everyone on, we are just pausing just a moment, having some technical difficulties with um, one of our presenters' audio. And she is back, Maria. Can you hear me now? You're good. Great. <laughs> 
It well, wouldn't be a, a tech, a, a panel on tech without some minor technical course. difficulties. <laughs> yeah, you can take it away now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today to moderate this panel with um, key experts in um, <clears throat> inclusion and accessible technology. I'm going to introduce them quickly so we can get into our conversation. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Louis Ors Orslein, who serves as the director of the employer and workplace policy team at the US Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. We're also joined by Janet Vicencio, an associate director of benefits with the AT&T Corporate Attendance and Leave Management Organization. And finally, uh, we're joined by Kevin Grog, a product owner for assistive technologies at Ernst & Young, or EY, who provides one-to-one -one AT services at a distance via Microsoft Teams. And Kevin, I'm gonna start with you. Um, and I know that Janet and Lou are going to have a lot to say on this question as well. Uh, EY is a global company with hundreds of thousands of employees. How did you all ensure that your employees could continue working safely and continue to be connected during the pandemic? Well, first of all, thank you, Maria, and thanks for everybody's attendance uh, today. Brief intro, I'm Kevin Grog. I have short brown hair. I'm wearing a black pullover and coming to you from a substantially cooler Atlanta, Georgia than it has been the last few weeks. So everybody, thank you for, thanks for your attendance and your attention. Uh, within Ernst & Young, one thing we had been doing at EY is we had been moving toward a greater percentage of our uh, employees being remote for now, I've been there five years. I started working remote from, I think it was day four. So we had, we had that already in process. It allowed us to transition, I won't say smoothly by any stretch, but it allowed, we had a foundation for, being, for, for remote work that allowed us to transition. And everybody, to give you sort of a numbers example, we are a Microsoft Teams uh, shop. And our original plan at the beginning of 2020 was one year, a 365 day rollout around the globe. We're in 150 countries north of 300,000 people. We're gonna take a year, we're gonna do it slowly, pace ourselves. COVID comes, we changed it from 365 days to 14. Two weeks, we went global to bring teams to everybody as of course, everybody needed to change the way that they did work. So Maria, we had a foundation to start with, but mm -hmm. we, did, we did have to enact some changes, but we did prepare, especially Microsoft Teams as our foundation to help everybody productively work from wherever. I, I think that's so important to acknowledge that whatever foundation companies have, they can use to, to pivot to make things continually more accessible. And Janet, I'm gonna to go to you next because like EY, AT&T has also had a long time culture of accessibility, not only in your products, but also in your internal uh, employee <clears throat> um, systems. So at, you know, at AAPD, we are really focused on elevating the voices of people with disabilities in policy and program decisions. And so I wanna know how AT&T worked with your abilities employee resource group to prioritize accessibility during the pandemic. Thank you, Maria. And thank you so much for having me today. I'm, I've really enjoyed uh, the, uh, the program thus far. And for those who can't see me, I have strawberry blonde hair. I'm wearing a blue dress. And I'm in bright, sunny Sacramento, mm -hmm. California. So I'm in a bright, sunny room. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's a, a beautiful day here, as always today. <laughs> but um, many of you know, AT&T has had a, a culture that really reflected the, reflects the diversity of, uh, of society. And um, we have 12 employee resource groups that reflect the diversity of, a, of our company's employees, one of which is Ability. And Ability is AT&T's uh, employee resources group dedicated to creating a culture 
of understanding and advocacy and advancement for individuals with disabilities. And I, Crystal Baker is probably here today. She's our chief executive officer of ability. <laughs> I'm sure she's here somewhere. Um, but uh, I, I'm with the HR organization at at and uh, for the last 25 years and have a real passion for ensuring that eight you know, ensuring AT&T, AT ts commitment to this, uh, this culture continues. Um, and so we've collaborated with Ability on many internal endeavors with focus groups and consultation um, that they've provided input into our disability and our job accommodations policies and systems. And, you know, as most companies, there were many obstacles that the pandemic uh, brought forward for all of us in, in many different ways. And there was many things we had to overcome with that, you know, agility and that out of the box thinking uh, to support our employees with disabilities. But although it was a trying year and there were many obstacles, as uh, I heard from many of the presenters thus far, there's also a, a many silver linings with this pandemic. Hard to believe, but yes, there are. Um, you know, positions that we thought were most likely in office in that traditional, um, you know, uh, have to go into the office uh, positions. Um, we're now being done virtually because of the pandemic, which was a huge lesson learned for us. Um, you know, with our out of the box thinking and, and working with many different organizations within AT&T coming together to set up our virtual workforce, it, it's been so eye-opening and it's probably one of our, our biggest lessons learned. Um, we've had um, many things that came up during this past year um that were as i said were you know potentially could have been a challenge but at t is so steeped in um in accommodating our employees and that's where i come in and where my team comes in we work with employees to accommodate and ensure that although we can offer them time off work as an accommodation we want to enable them to keep doing the job that they are doing and being a productive member of our teams. So um, although we, we did offer time off work as a job accommodation, the other, the other piece of that is getting people set up virtually, which was a, a huge part of that. Um, whether it was um, you know, with virtual office setups, um, ergonomic situation, complex assistive technology at home so they could do their job. I've heard a lot about web, um, I'm sorry, MS Teams. We are using MS Teams. Carrie Renna talked about the benefits and the features of that. Captioning, um, video conference calls. Um, it, it has just obviously exploded for our company this year. And um, uh, I was really impressed by Lauren Romanski's presentation on some of the issues that virtual workforces present. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about solving some of those issues. But, um, you know, as a whole, um, we've really learned a lot. And um, I heard someone say yesterday when we were discussing this topic that it has really sort of leveled the playing field for people. It's allowed folks to, um, you know, work from home and no one know, you know, we don't know where they are, what part of the country, we're all kind of in a level playing field. So th those are some of the kind of our lessons learned at at t this year. Um, and as I said, it was a challenging year, but with that, there were many silver linings. Thanks so much, Janet. Lou, I want to go to you now. You've worked in disability um, employment policy and accommodations for decades. And for decades, people with disabilities have heard, this job isn't eligible for telework, or this job can't be performed remotely. And now uh, we know that's not true, as, as Janet has mentioned. So what can employers do to ensure that this workplace flexibility we've had during the pandemic and other opportunities 
are maintained as we move towards a post-pandemic reality? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for that question, Maria. And uh, just for everyone's benefit, so um, I'm a white man, graying hair, um, I'm black glasses, um, and I'm coming from uh, the mountains of Pennsylvania, and we've had some snow this morning, some unexpected snow. So we're also having a bit of a cold spell. Um, you know, I, what I think is really is that the important thing is, is exactly what you said, Maria, is that, the, you know, the, the first takeaway from the pandemic is that jobs that were presumed to be office-based um, really can be done from home and be done effectively and people can be productive. I mean, it's amazing, as Kevin points out, how quickly we've been able to adapt environments. I, I mean, it's just, it's just absolutely um, uh, sort of um, unfathomable a year ago that we could have moved so far so quickly. And I, but I really think there's a, a number of short-term and longer-term tasks to remember. Um, I think it's it, as as we start to see employees returning to the to the workplace, um, or we look at now a longer term plan to sustain people in the workplace. I think it's going to be re really essential for us to to reengage, um, to either continue or uh, reinitiate the interactive process for employees who have had prior accommodations or those who have new accommodations. Um, because of um, the, the, the setup that they have now. Um, we'll, we'll really need to tease out what's the most uh, effective working situation for the employee and the um, organization as a whole. So that's going to take some work on organizationals, organizations part. Um, and, and we have to realize that too, the telework is, is, is effective for many people, but um, some people find telework isolating and they're not most productive in an isolated um, circumstance. So it's going to, you know, again, we're gonna to have to re-engage. Then I think companies are really gonna to have to look even more deeply into their hiring practices and their technologies. So, you know, virtual uh, uh, platforms may not be the best way to interview somebody with autism, right? Um, or your onboarding and training processes, and that's enough technology there. Some deaf employees may need sign language interpreters um, as well as captioning. Uh, so we're used to, you know, oftentimes providing one or the other uh, without really the engaging with people to see what their needs are. Um, and, and when you look at your performance management process, right, for the long term, what technology to use there? Um, are all of your PDF forms that are digitally signed, are those accessible? So we're really gonna have to look at all of these facets of the employee life cycle um, and all of the processes. And particularly, again, with more of, in more of a teleworking mode and this hybrid mode, you know, what is accessible, what isn't accessible and develop a plan. I think, I think it's gonna be important too to debrief and really look very much like what Janet has been doing at at and And you know, what has your accommodation and technology teams, what have they done? What, what's worked, what hasn't worked? Um, we need to better understand accessibility and interoperability of, uh, of, um, of all of the technologies that we're using now. That's for all really needs to be all of our mantra. We've been talking about that for years, but universal accessibility is, is definitely come of age in the pandemic age. I mean, it is just time, right? Um, and, uh, you know, to use the Biden administration uh, um, um, sort of mantra and phrase, build back better, right? That's what we want to do. Um, if we really want to level the playing field, then that means accessibility for all. And it just to be built in from the beginning, as again, we've been saying, um, for for decades, um, and, and and also to to talk about uh, to just to hone in on what Janet was saying too, it's just really important to don't forget um, setups. Um, you know how will you in the future ensure that somebody's screen reader is working appropriately and effectively for them in a in a home situation or in a hoteling situation where you're bringing people in and they're sharing spaces, right? How exactly is that going to work? Um, and, and in the long run, um, I think we're going to have to reevaluate job descriptions um, in this new reality. Uh, and, and one final thing I think too is that we really need to look at is benefits. In light of the pandemic and the impacts on mental health and well-being, 
companies really need to reconsider their benefits offerings and consider expanding maybe their employee assistance programs. And I know that's kind of beyond the scope of, of what we're talking about today in terms of technology, but in some ways it isn't because what we're talking to uh, for mental health with the lack of um, uh, the shortage of, of counselors out there is that um, many people are gonna access telehealth um, and, tele and they may be doing that from work. So how do we ensure that people have this benefit and that this benefit is accessible to everyone? Um, so, so I think those are, those are sort of, those are my uh, first uh, thoughts about that. Thank you, Lou. And I, I think so many of your points are so good, but particularly acknowledging um, that a, an employee with a disability or disabilities um, may not only have one, you know, dis one type of disability, right, or one type of disability identity. Um, and I'm going to go into my next question, which is a question for all of you. Um, many of the survivors of COVID will now be adjusting to work and life with a disability. Uh, and even for folks who have not survived COVID, um, but who may now have a psychiatric disability because of their experiences during the pandemic, um, employees with pre-existing disabilities may be adjusting to life with new disabilities. What are some of the things that uh, employers can do to make sure all of these new members of the disability community who may not identify as disabled, who may not be aware of their rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act um, can continue to engage meaningfully in their careers? So Kevin, why don't we start with you? Sure, thanks Maria. Uh, what what we'll be doing is a lot of what we have already been doing is making increasing the awareness of what is out there and what benefit is out there for you. I can speak more so from the, the zeros and ones from the, from the tech angle and with assistive technology, if you are a new user to assistive technology, a veteran user and maybe encountering something that is new and inaccessible, what we want to be able to do is let you know that in our case, assistive technology is out there, it's global, it is available to everybody, and it is something that you can take advantage of. Uh, while I, I will never claim to be an expert in the uh, mental health area or anything like that, part of my job though is if anybody comes to me because we have the word assist in our name, is being able to direct somebody to an area for somebody, let's say in that case, who knows more than me, who can help out. We, you know, a, a kind of a mantra we have is we're never going to we're never going to tell somebody that we're not sure what to do, or we're not going to we're not going to leave you without an avenue that we can handhold you through to get to somebody, no matter the case. While I can have in-depth meetings on the technology itself, I am an IT geek at heart, so that's that, that's where my strength is going to come from. But at the same time. In assistive technology, uh, it's more than the zeros and ones. It's the human factor. We're all individuals. We do not solve anything with bots. We do not use automation, even though we love we love all our toys and tech, that's for sure. But we're not going to use that to solve health or medical situations. We meet one-to-one. -one. That's a cornerstone of our assistive technology service. We tell you we're going to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, as long as you are comfortable with that, to let you know how we can assist. And whether it's myself in the assistive tech area, whether it's I need to um, help the person go to another area, and it also being global, it can be very different from country to country. So I'll rely on uh, individuals in country of our 150 nations to help out as well. But the main um, core of this is increasing awareness so that our people are uh, make our, you know, our people can be as comfortable as possible to reach out because it's tough to ask for help. It is tough to reach out and show vulnerability. We, we know that we are always, you know, we're a constant, we're here to help. Please reach out. We, we do have to have you reach out to us for privacy reasons. Of course, we can't reach, we couldn't reach out to proactively, but reach out to us. We are there, whether it's tech, whether it's uh, the softer, you know, the softer skills or such, we try to bring all of that together, but it comes down to increasing awareness, Here's how we can, here's how EY can help. Janet, how about you? Yes, thanks, Marie. I was uh, hoping you'd call on me next. I agree with Kevin and uh, 
and what EY is doing. I feel like at and is in the same realm of things. The, the big, we're, we're not going to solve things with bots. Like Kevin said, we can I always say you can't take the human out of human resources. Okay. The most important aspect is that we continue to engage with our employees, listen to them and determine how we can best support their needs in the workplace. And awareness is so key because like you said, there are supervisors who may not even realize they have folks on their team that may need assistance, okay? So it's, it's really educating, um, advocating, and um, empathizing with our employees, okay? And um, my advice to employers would be to have a well-established process so that when a supervisor, you know, uh, or a person determines that they need assistance, there's some place they can go to, okay, where they can have, um, they can get that assistance. <clears throat> they can learn about, you know, uh, what is needed in the workplace. Um, I, I have to always tell my supervisors to keep an open mind and be open to all possibilities. Um, and that's, you know, that's certainly a lesson learned from the pandemic is that there are, you know, there are great possibilities, things we never thought could happen. Uh, like Lou, Lou said, happened quickly. And, um, and, you know, we have these virtual workforces now we have, you know, we're using new technology and, you know, it's one year in, into this and hopefully it's coming to an end soon, but, um, you know, we have to be open to possibilities and I believe awareness, like I agree with Kevin hundred percent is just being aware of your employees needs and, and, and being able to guide them as to where they can get assistance. And then having those folks there, like myself and my team who are ready to assist. And Lou, you're gonna give us uh, your, your thoughts and that'll be our closing thoughts as we've reached the end of our panel. Uh, so Lou, uh, take, us, take us away. Sure, so, so I, you know, I, I, I just totally agree with and second what uh, Kevin and Janet suggest it's awareness. I mean, awareness is so important. And this is an, an awareness of a good, inclusive infrastructure and robust interactive process. So what we know works uh, and what we know does work over the, over the decades is a robust and well-communicated -communi accommodation policy and practice. Um, you also need an integrated, um, well-communicated, telework policy in place that is inclusive of telework as an accommodation. You need a readily accessible fund that can quickly procure the accommodations that people need. You need an expedited process for that, not the standard procurement process. I mean, that may be a centralized accommodation fund or not. Um, different organizations do it effectively different. And you need an, uh, you know, an accessibility and inter interoperability expert like Kevin. I mean, that's one of the best practices over there at EY that they have a, a, a position and someone like Kevin who can really troubleshoot. So, in, 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 and through these, all of these processes, then I think that, you know, we really will hear the needs of uh, employees with long COVID. And, you know, we could respond then to the adjustments as necessary so that we can ensure that they are kept um, productive. Um, and, and if they need to re-enter the workplace that they, uh, that, you know, that there is a um, continuum for re-entering uh, the workplace. I, I think that there's one cautionary tale though. You know, I think there might be the tendency to um, over-medicalize um, um, long COVID and the health effects. So I, I would really suggest that we all resist this. And again, we focus on what's important. What's important is what is challenging the individual and what kind of adjustments can we be made to you know, overcome those challenges and be sure of course, to speak with their consultants um, at Jan. Uh, and, and I think uh, you know, we've so, shown so much resilience and agility over the past year um, I, I really think that if we do this, um, we will continue to hire and retain the best talent, and that includes people with disabilities. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining our panel today. I'm now going to turn it back over to Christopher Lee. Have Maria, a great day. Thank you so much. Thank this you very much. Thank you, panelists. Um, excellent points. Um, well taken. Um, 
We're going to take a short break here, a three to five minutes, probably about more like three minutes, and then we'll bring on Susan and our next panelist and um, Lightning Talks. So again, short break, come back three minutes, and we'll start again. Thank you. Here we go. This is Sam Evans. I believe we're going to have a few minutes break and I'm going to introduce our music back and our slideshow featuring. Oops. Get our slideshow back. We can get this. We are displaying some slides from our sponsoring and supporting organizations. Today's 2021 M Enabling Summit is brought to you by G3 ICT and EJ Kraus with support from the IAAP M Enabling Virtual Production Team. We appreciate our accessibility team of trans interpreters and captionists. We follow the tweets today at hashtag mEnabling21 and hashtag mEnablingBriefing21. A few images from mEnabling programs in person. We'll look forward to being together in person again when it's best for everyone. Today's leadership briefing is powered by AT&T and T-Mobile. <laughs> familiar faces in our images and photos from M enabling sessions in the past with opportunities to network engage and learn hope some of you are seeing yourself in some of these photos <laughs> today's virtual leadership briefing again is powered by AT&T and T-Mobile Some of our presenters are featured on this screen. I see some of our audience members, P Pina and, and other colleagues. <laughs> At M Enabling Summits, uh, uh, Christine Lebois often brings a xylophone and, and, and sounds a, a, a soft tone to alert us it's time to go back to sessions. So uh, we won't have that today, but I'll let Dr. Christopher Lee let us know when we're ready to come back from our break today. I think we're ready, Sam. This is Christopher. Thank you for that audio description. Always very nice. So we're going to jump into our second part of the briefing. Um, we're a little tight on time, so I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive on getting everyone under control a little bit. So Susan, if I jump in, forgive me. <laughs> Um, so our next, um, our next session um, is, is in two parts. Um, let me just share my screen here. We've got a lightning talk and um, as well as 
lightning talk and then a panel um, presentation. Um, I want to bring in um, Susan. Um, Susan, it's been a while since I've seen you. Um, Susan, yeah, it's been a while. It has. I, I, I've missed seeing you. Hopefully soon. <laughs> Hopefully soon. For uh, most of you who don't know me, my name is Susan Masrui. I am a director of global public policy at AT&T. And I'm probably the least important person that you'll be hearing in the next half hour. Um, it is my great privilege to introduce Director Jenny Yang. She is the director of the OFCCP or the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. If you have a company that's doing any business with the federal government, you should know this program. And for anybody who's been in the field of equal opportunity, you will know Director Yang from all the dedicated work she did on, uh, on the um, EEOC, as well as the chair. I'm going to hand it over to you, Director Yang, because I know people are just eager to hear what you have to say about what government's perspective is. What are the opportunities of the future of the work uh, for people with disabilities? So welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's terrific to be here with you all today. I just started at OFCCP three months ago and I am energized by the work of our agency to expand opportunity to good jobs for people with disabilities. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion that will follow today on telework and I enjoyed the excellent comments from the panel before which also address some of these issues. And I'd like to start by addressing the unprecedented time we are still in more than one year into the pandemic. We are facing um, not only COVID, but economic uncertainty, as well as a racial reckoning over criminal justice and other forms of inequality. What we've seen is that people with disabilities are facing even greater challenges in obtaining employment than ever before. So I wanna commend you all for all that you have done to support workers during these very tumultuous times. We know that advancing equal opportunity is only one of the many critical issues you have been facing. And OFCCP is here to be a partner in helping federal contractors navigate the many challenges as we transition back to in-person work once it is safe to do so. I expect that the future of work will change dramatically after our experience during this pandemic. And chief among this is how employers will use telework in the future. In the context of the pandemic, a key issue for employers is how they will ensure workers have access to the tools and technology they need to succeed. And this has been especially important for people with disabilities. And before I go into these issues further, I wanted to share a bit of background on the work of OOCCP for those of you who are not familiar with the agency. We are part of the Department of Labor and we ensure that those companies who do business with the federal government satisfy their contractual promise to advance equal opportunity and affirmative action. We enforce Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act which requires contractors to ensure non-discrimination and promote affirmative action for people with disabilities. And this, these requirements essentially parallel the Americans with Disabilities Act. These requirements also include an aspirational disability utilization goal of 7% for federal contractors, so 7%. Um, and that is for contractors with a certain threshold of $50,000 in contracts or 50 or more employees. And contractors use this goal to analyze underrepresentation of workers and to ensure they are recruiting and attracting the talent that they need. At OFCCP, we are committed to ensuring these disability protections achieve their fullest protections. And what we've seen in this pandemic is that our disability laws have stood the test of time and are providing guidance to employers and workers now and not navigating many of the novel issues that are arising because of our pandemic. It, the laws build in flexibility and enable employers to adapt to challenging circumstances, even in times of crisis. We have seen that many, uh, many jobs can be performed effectively remotely. 
There are also many that can't, and that burden has fallen disproportionately on communities of color, many of which who have had to come into work and have faced the hazards of COVID head on. And what we're seeing though is a shift, right? More than half of US workers are now teleworking in some form with over a quarter reporting full-time telework status. That is up from 7% by some estimates before the pandemic. This is a major topic of discussion for us at DOL as well, because we've seen how effectively our employees have been over this past year while in a telework posture. We did a telework survey across the agency and 66% of our workforce said they prefer to telework all the time or nearly all the time. So that will impact our decision-making for the future. Increased telework presents an opportunity to expand employment opportunities for workers with disabilities and can also increase workforce participation, uh, particularly for those who face barriers to commuting. It, for employers, it can reduce overhead costs um, and also increase efficiency. But again, there are many challenges as we uh, work in this telework posture. And one is ensuring that employers provide reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities. And that is particularly true as we think about returning to work after the pandemic. And I just wanted to address some of the key issues that have come up. Of course, you need to ensure that uh, workers now can work remotely and have the reasonable accommodations they need and the ability to use technology to successfully perform their job. As we think about returning to work, there are a number of practical considerations for employers, um, particularly for workers who may wish to continue telework rather than coming back in. And so I just wanted to remind uh, people about a few points under the ADA and what essential functions are, right? Essential functions of a position are the reason that the person does a job, why that job exists, the very fundamental duties, and whereas marginal functions are incidental and they may not be part of the fundamental duties of the job. So in analyzing what is essential, um, that analysis really doesn't change due to COVID, but there is there are considerations in, way, in the way the position may have changed due to the virus. An employer is not required to remove an essential function from a position to uh, provide a reasonable accommodation. But if an employer has chosen to restructure a position based on changes in their business model due to the pandemic, an employer must do an assessment of what constitutes an essential function based on those changes. So the fact that an employer chose uh, for the health and safety of the workplace to temporarily excuse an employee from performing certain essential functions of their position does not necessarily mean that an employer has permanently changed the essential functions of a position or that telework during normal circumstances would not cause undue hardship. But it doesn't mean that if an employer previously denied requests to telework, it can rest on that same basis today. Because what we've seen over the past year is that many jobs that may have been thought to not lend themselves to telework can have in fact be performed successfully in a telework posture. And again, this is all a very fact-based fact determination. If an employee can demonstrate that a disability related limitation requires accommodation, and if the limitation can be effectively addressed through a different type of accommodation other than telework, the EUC has said that the employer may opt to use that alternate accommodation as long as it's effective. Yet if an employee with a disability requests the telework accommodation, the experience teleworking during this time may be relevant to the renewed request if it helps show whether or not the employee was able to perform all of the essential functions of their position while teleworking. This experience would also be relevant um, to determining whether there is an undue hardship on the employer. So this does not mean that an employer is now required to provide telework just because it has been performed in the past, but it will be a subject that should be explored in the interactive process.
Another question that arises is what if employees are nervous or concerned about their health and other uh, issues when coming back to the office once the business determines it is safe to reopen? So in this case, it's important for managers to understand that fear and anxiety can rise to the level of a disability where an employee has a documented medical mental health condition or other medical condition that interferes with a major life activity. Employees may have medical conditions that make it more difficult to handle the disruption to daily life that has accompanied COVID-19. For example, employees with PTSD or other documented mental health conditions may request reasonable accommodations based on specific manifestations of these diagnoses. And in those situations, again, it is a very individualized fact-based determination. Employers uh, can handle this request for accommodation by asking questions to determine whether the condition is a disability, by discussing with the employee how to request an accommodation, how this requested accommodation would assist and enable the employee to keep working, as well as explore potential alternative accommodations that may effectively meet the needs of the employee and the workforce. And the employer can request medical docu documentation if needed. So those are a couple of the uh, you know, legal issues coming up and I know there are many others. The EEOC will be exploring many of these issues um, at the commission meeting that they are holding next week on the impact of COVID on the workforce and they will be periodically, the agency has been updating their guidance related to COVID. So that's something to keep an eye on as well. And I know we are gonna to head to our panel. And so as I wrap up, I just wanted to share a couple points on technology and hiring, because we know that increasingly employers are using online and technology to facilitate hiring. And that's particularly true during the pandemic. And it's important both that these systems are accessible to people with disabilities, that people with disabilities understand and have enough information to understand how these systems are working so that they know if they need to request a reasonable accommodation. And this is particularly true with some of the newer um, algorithmic or artificial intelligence uh, power tech hiring assessments. Many of these new assessments such as video-based interviews are using automation to measure micro expressions, vocal cadence, eye contact, and those kinds of metrics can lead to a systematic exclusion of people with various disabilities who may present differently than the norm on which this data has been measured. And many of these workers could successfully perform the job, but they may be screened out by that process. But the challenge is that many of these systems do not disclose how they're working. So often employees do not know if they need to request a reasonable accommodation. So those are also very important issues for employers to be considering as we think about how work is changing in the future and the way in which we can rely on technology both to advance equity and to identify barriers to opportunity. So as we work to recover and rebuild as a nation, we need to make sure we support all of our workers, including workers with disabilities. And we can then ensure that we build back a more equitable future for all Americans. Thank you so much for having me and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Director Yang. Um, not just for the work that we know you'll be doing at Department of Labor, but um, your long dedication and commitment to equal opportunity as well. Thank you so much. I'm gonna ask my panelists to come on, um, turn on their videos and audio and do quick productions. My name is Susan Masrui. I work for AT&T and Global Public Policy. I am a woman in her 50s with brown hair and a blue suit. So we're gonna go through this very quickly so we can get to the, the meat of the matter. So Neil, you wanna start? Sure, I'm, I'm Neil Milliken. I'm head of accessibility for Atos Globally. I'm a middle-aged white male with brown glasses and a stripy shirt and a big green plant behind the back of my head. 
Sachin. Hi, everyone. My name is Sachin Pavitran. I'm the executive director of the US Access Board. Um, I, I'm a blind person of Southeast Asian descent. I'm wearing a light pink shirt uh, with blurred background. And Bill. Hi, everyone. Bill Curtis Davidson here, um, co-director at the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, um, funded by the US Department of Labor. And I am a white male, um, also middle-aged um, with a uh, salt and pepper goatee and glasses that help me see better as I age. Nice to be with you today. Thank you, welcome. Um, we appreciate all the time you're know, spending with us today. Did make me remember that I have sunglasses, I'm blind and Japanese American. Um, but to get to the point today, companies have had to change how they do business because of the pandemic. How has working remotely impacted employees with disabilities? And what has helped businesses be prepared to support employees with disabilities during this transition? And please jump in. Oh, who's going to be I will. Neil. Okay, so this is Neil. So um, as someone that's homeworked for six years prior to, to, to COVID hitting, uh, I, I've come from an organization that's used to doing this and it does it for, for clients. I think that the difference is that, that people still had the freedom to go other places, meet and, and everything else. So that, that sense of being all in on remote working and for it to then um, also be everyone doing it had an immediate change on culture. So, so suddenly people that worked from home that had some space are now, you know, what would have been a five minute conversation in the corridor is now scheduling meetings and so on. So that, that was alluded to by the, by the, the, the lady from Gartner. Um, we also had people with dis, uh, disabilities working uh, and had a, an informal network of support in their offices. Um, you know, and, and what that's done is it's, it's accelerated the, um, the, the disclosure or the self-identification or the, the, the sort of requirements of, of you know, making workplace accommodations. So, so that's accelerated um, and it has encouraged some, some self-identification because people don't have that informal network anymore. Um, what we've also found is that we, um, we had our employee networks and, and that helped a lot. And we had an established uh, accessibility policy and all of the other things that I spend my day job thinking about, but I don't think anyone's still prepared to the intensity of being on video calls all day long and the increasing length of the day. Because uh, again, referring back to the lady from Gartner, it's, it's fatiguing. Um, and it's not just fatiguing for neurodivergent individuals like me, it's fatiguing for everyone. Faction, what did you see at the Access Board? What have you heard on this issue? So, so you know the the issue, issues similar to what the lady mentioned earlier, the fatigue that comes in uh, uh, in doing such work when you have meetings back to back. You know what is that? What kind of toll does it take? But also the idea of how businesses are transitioning into a in a work setting that's virtual but also expecting the virtual environment to function just the way it was functioning before the virtual environment. So having this expectation that your work setting needs to really play out the way it was pre-pandemic, which kind of puts hardship on uh, uh, people at large, but also people with disabilities because it, it introduces new barriers, accessibility barriers, with technology might not being able to uh, compensate for what we need to do. For example, if if you are expected to do certain work in your in in your regular office setting, uh, how conference meetings and different things go on, and just expecting that mentality of eight to five work with a lot of other things going on in your background, sometimes might not really happen, work well in the tech, you know, even though if you have the technology in place. So there needs to be a change in mindset that work settings cannot be 
if you're going to go into a virtual environment, it cannot be just how it was pre-pandemic. There needs to be a cultural shift on how we redefine work settings uh, if, if you know virtual is the way we're going. And, and Bill, what are your thoughts around this? What has made companies successful? What has been the challenges? Well, as many have discussed, we saw so many changes with uh, workplace uh, structures and then uh, looking at how tasks can be done. Um, benefits such as job restructuring, flexual scheduling, working from home, et cetera, have been great. But uh, the challenges for employees with disabilities have been magnified uh, when there's a lack of that inclusive mindset that Sachin just mentioned and programs for educating staff, prioritizing accessible procurement, um, and then integrating uh, in new technologies, which we'll talk about more, I'm sure. Um, mm -hmm. On the plus side, of course, uh, much advancement in, in things like virtual meeting tools. Um, but as was said earlier, uh, what we've seen at Pete is a real need to uh, make sure that telework and accessibility practices continue to be shared even for the tools that exist today, uh, so often uh, guidance is needed. And that's why we produced a telework and accessibility toolkit, which has been one of our most um, sought after content elements on our website uh, this last year that helps uh, with creating digital content, virtual meetings, training staff, and then also providing tips for employees themselves who are um, part of this whole transformation. One of the things that I've noticed is that companies that have looked at accessibility and inclusion from the get-go have really made the transition much easier because their tools, what they've procured, what they're using, their training materials are already developed. Is that something that you've heard um, in your work? And anyone can answer that. Uh, from the Pete side yes we have definitely seen that and again we want to enable all employers i think so many employers are becoming aware through the the voice of people with disabilities and people that are uh, needing uh, access in these ever-changing hybrid uh, environments um, they know that there's something that has to be done and i think we're also operating uh, broadly, as we've all recognized in a, a larger effort for equity, right? Diversity, mm -hmm. equity, and inclusion. So we have definitely seen an uptick in attention to the needs of people with disabilities. But again, with the fast pace of, of the use of technology and including new tech that we'll talk probably more about, it's uh, a continual need to invest in uh, programs, even if you don't have them yet, right? Starting something, if you don't have anything. Susan, this is such an, uh, if I could jump in real quick, you know, if, if you would have, if you look at April of last year, where technology was in, in a virtual environment and where it is right now, and the intensity of how we're using the technology, but the changes that has happened just in features and all the different aspects that has come in within the last year, it, it feel, it, it's almost, uh, it's amazing to see the, uh, the advancement in one year. But the problem is not everyone can keep up that pace. So what are we doing to empower staff, disability or not, to um, you know, make, bring them along to not just embrace it, but also add the skill set to be able to do their function, daily function in, in this changing environment. So I think uh, employers really need to not just put tools out there and let employees mm -hmm. figure it out. We need to have best practices on how we can increase the skill sets, you know, are we doing things to improve skill sets along with everything else that's happening in the transition? That's an excellent point. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of changes, like you said, in the technology, things becoming more and more accessible, but there are other issues. What do you all see, um, Bill and Neil, what do you see about the new technologies that are coming out that might be le leveling the playing field? And, and what are the, the pros and cons or, or what advice could you give around those technologies? 
Great. So, well, I mean, I'm, I'll let Bill talk mostly about the XR because he's deeply immersed in, in that world. Uh, although I've got some skin in the game, it's um, it's it's definitely something that Bill can speak to. So, um, I think that that we talk a lot about AI, and we, you know, actually some of the stuff that we now call AI is machine learning. It's been around for an awful long time. It's how we're applying it. However, it's 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 the fact that it's everywhere now that is is really both exciting and also a bit of a double-edged sword because as has already been mentioned you know it may impact on on our recruitment processes it may impact on um how we perceive things but at the same time you know the the automatic speech recognition which powers the captions the the natural language processing is helping us to at least be able to maybe cope with some of the the deluge of information that we've got. Because if we're spending all day on meetings, we're also spending all day on meetings not fully paying attention because we're seeing our inbox fill up, our messages go up. We need to be able to kind of prioritize all of this stuff. And, and as someone with you know, cognitive accessibility needs as dyslexic and ADHD, that, that overwhelm, that fatigue that is caused by all of this also you know, it affects our decision making. So I think that that I'm quite excited about being able to use this technology to, to help um, the really important information be brought to the front because, because that sense making and that filtering is something that we're all going to need, um, regardless of whether it's assistive for me or just really darn helpful for, for everyone else. Um, and, and I think that that also using the, the AI, the image recognition and all of this stuff to add accessibility metadata to all of the stuff that we're doing is, is super important. Final point before I let, let Bill speak is actually the, the, the speed of change is so great uh, now. Um, we talked about having accessible procurement, but, but you enter into procurement uh, deals that last years and, and the interfaces last weeks. So um, it's okay to check it when it comes in, but actually you need to be continuously doing it. So it's not just a case of, of, of sort of going, right, we bought this, you know, we've checked it, you're good to go. It's actually a, about this continuous process of monitoring and understanding the interoperability and then communicating that to the users. And I don't think anyone's got it nailed yet. We're working hard on it, but I don't think anyone's got it nailed yet. And Bill, what do you see in new technologies with ICT? Sure. Um, one big area that Pete has had a focus on for a couple of years, at least, is extended reality. And that simply means virtual, augmented, and mixed reality technologies. Um, sometimes they're experienced with a head-mounted display, but also you can see VR in your web browser, on your desktop, or a mobile device. Um, and there's more and more support coming out. And there's reported products coming uh, that already exist, of course, from the likes of Facebook, Oculus. Uh, but new products coming out that are uh, reported from Apple and others, right? Microsoft and others. Um, and I formerly uh, served at Magic Leap, which is another company building mixed reality. These technologies have really undergone a boom. Uh, they were highly experimental and used sort of exploring uses before the pandemic. And really the pandemic has caused um, companies and organizations to experiment with XR as a way to help people communicate, connect, and be collaborating and be co-present with each other. Because there are actual plethora of apps now where you can digitally be co-present uh, with your colleagues from other parts of the world, or if they're in the same room with you, um, you can be in a fully virtualized environment, or uh, I could be sitting in the office I'm in right now and have of a three a volumetric video or holographic uh, representation of you, Susan, uh, sitting near me uh, in my space, and you would see the exact opposite. Uh, or, and again, but I'm using the word see, the challenge we have is everyone being able to use these new technologies, which really are a new computing paradigm. And so um, what I have, often said, and we continue to say in efforts like xraccess.org, which is a dedicated community focused on the accessibility of this new paradigm, uh, is that when we design with people with disabilities 
leading design, we can gain so much uh, understanding of novel ways to approach this new technology space. Mm -hmm. um, how can we design it and leverage all of the kinds of uh, inputs and outputs, uh, whether that's uh, eye tracking for someone who can't maybe move their hands um, or um, other embodied inputs like voice input, uh, being able to uh, see, hear, and have tactile uh, haptic feedback um, from uh, interactions with digital content and what have you. So we see a lot, and, and this is now um, a credible technology. Uh, the XR Act Association, uh, the leading uh, platform uh, association, uh, published a report last fall called A New Reality in Immersive Technology. Um, where they found that 75% of business leaders have heard about XR now, and they plan to spend more on it in the next five years. And almost all of the respondents said they're going to use it to help recover uh, as they build back, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, it'll be pandemic. interesting to see the social impacts and see if there's mental health advantages to these new technologies. I think it's great. Um, Director Yang talked about the importance of being able to go online and um, make sure that employees with disabilities or potential employees with disabilities are supported. And Sachin, at the Access Board, I know the Access Board has worked a long time on accessibility. Can you give two or three sentences of advice for companies who have heard for the first time, we have to be accessible and don't know what that means? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, maybe resources. <laughs> so, you know, when, when we when we throw around the word accessibility, you know, this, it's often uh, ta taken in, in many different ways. Now, how, how do we ensure full accessibility or full inclusion? Uh, you, know, com you know, companies have come around uh, in the last year to do a lot of innovative ways of making uh, Employees included. Now, what what have what lessons has been learned in those practices? With the Access Board, you know, one of the things that we continue to push for is when we when we say accessibility, it's it's not just just certain aspects of it. You know, you need to make sure the entire process, the, you know, but the, from the time interviewing starts, like uh, Director Yang was saying, you know, what happens when the in interviewing process is going on? What's happening when someone's being onboarded? What's happening when they are, you know, part of your team? Uh, are they getting the same experience in this environment as your other peers on your team is getting? So we have to evaluate all those different levels of accessibility. It's not, you can't have, say we have accessible tools and that should work for every aspect of the different things that you do within your work settings. So there needs to be evaluation done in the different aspects of, you know, different functions that happens in your, uh, in your department or organization. So accessibility cannot be just done, just, you know, one size that fits all. You know, it's great that we've we come a long way since this last year, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done. So it's not just a matter of following standards, but it's also a matter of testing from end to end. Yes, the exactly. The experience a person would have. Um, Bill, Neil, Sachin, two seconds, Two sentences each on advice. If you could just reach out to all the audience members, get them prepared for the new technologies that are coming out today and serving customers or employees with disabilities. Bill? Uh, my advice would be to again adopt a disability led innovation mindset, whether you're a developer of these new tech or implementing them. You need to have people with disabilities helping lead these efforts and be a part of designing. Uh, whether the, it's the base product or the implementation so that they're designed with intentionality and we can unpack challenges that need to be addressed. And Neil? Yeah, I, I'd echo what Bill says, just the earlier you get engagement with the community in the process, the easier it is and the better the outcome. People with disabilities are your best early adopters and beta testers. Thank you very much. And Sachin? 
suggestions? Sorry, I, was, um, I echo the comments that, that was said by Neil and Bill, but I also want to reiterate what I said earlier. Testing, testing, testing. Please do not stop evaluating any you know anything that you're going to procure. And I know we're running late, so we're going to head back to Christopher, but thank you to all the panelists. Um, great advice, um, great insights. And Christopher, back oh, to you. Susan, thank you so much. Thank you, panelists. Excellent points. Um, wish we had more time, um, but we are running close. We do have a, a second poll that I'm going to put up um, on the screen um, right now. Take just a, a moment. Um, I'll read the poll. Should organizations um, proactively redefine their employment policies and practice in light of virtual technologies advances? And you have two options um, to choose from one yes and um, the other one is no. Okay, it's coming in. I'm going to share it. Results. We have um, an overwhelming 99% um, yes and 1% no. So um, nice job. Okay, so in our closing remarks, um, I wanna in invite James Thurston to the floor. James is the VP for Global Strategy and Development at G3ICT. It's all yours, James. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Christopher. And what a, what a great set of discussions and speakers. Um, uh, just a couple of things that I want to, to maybe add um, to summarize uh, and then talk a little bit about next steps. Uh, I think what we heard across all these speakers across the different sessions is that the pandemic really presented us with uh, a need for an accelerated focus on accessibility and inclusion in the workplace. Um, and we heard from Jenny Lay Fleury that Microsoft uh, from, from what they heard in their disability answer desk that there was this increased focus both by enterprise customers and consumers on accessibility. Um, Neil talked about an accelerated self-identification uh, as of people with disabilities in the workplace and need for accommodations. Uh, Sachin just talked about accelerated uh, features in technology, accelerated accessibility features in technology. And what are the implications for training and being able to, to use those features uh, with quick turnarounds and cycles in technology. Um, and then we, we also heard a lot across these panels, I think about post pandemic coming out of the pandemic, uh, how do we need to rethink our approaches? Uh, Lauren from Gartner, I think presented some amazing data uh, and really made the point that our, our old premises about work no, no longer apply, even about terms like worker uh, and that, that they're outdated already. And we need to be rethinking that when we're thinking about inclusive workplaces and really redesigning the workplace for, uh, for hybrid work, hybrid workplaces, with a focus on fatigue, uh, new collaboration norms, um, and employee performance. Fantastic. And in this last panel, I think it was really powerful here in the discussion, which again, we heard throughout all the speakers on, on the need for change in culture. And I think it was that Bill that mentioned um, that those companies, those organizations, those employers who already had systems and in, in a, a culture of diversity and inclusion in place fared better during the pandemic and will fare better probably coming out of the pandemic uh, than those who didn't. So we really need to focus on getting those systems and cultures into place. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll just wrap up. I want to invite you, my, my colleague Yulia should be posting some information in the chat uh, as a sort of follow-up to this great discussion and important work. G3ICT has just started partnering with, with Steelcase and other partners to look at the inclusive workplace of the future and really define that moving forward, a workplace that's inclusive, but also safe and compelling. And uh, uh, we invite you to take a, a survey to, um, to give your perspective on that. Uh, Julio will be posting that and also uh, follow the work and participate in the work. And there's a, a link to the project page. With that, I'll uh, uh, excel or, or Christopher, I don't know if one of you want to, to wrap up. Yes, thank you, James. I appreciate it. Um, we have reached the end of our, um, a wonderful program, the briefing, um, 2021 leadership briefing. We want to thank our um, sponsors, AT&T and um, T-Mobile. We want to thank all the panelists and all the speakers. It's been a great event. We want to thank the accessibility team. Thank you, Beth and colleague. Um, great job. We want to thank EJ Krause. Um, we want to thank about the team with G3ICT and the IAAP. 
And I do want to say that um, it, after this proceedings in the next couple months, be on the lookout for a white paper um, regarding some of the key facts that we learned today through the briefing. So congratulations, everyone, and nice job. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.